the items here. First items uh, signed away was the Zoom meeting information. Just, just make sure everyone has that. Obviously, folks who are on here were able to receive that, so we're good there. Uh, Michael Piat, Vice Chair. Yes, sir. I'm here. Sir, Alder Brian Johnson. I might think he's giving us a here. Okay, perfect. Yep. Uh, John Kelwartz. I believe is John is. I don't think John is with us. Uh, Glenn Sherman. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Uh, Terry Yang. Here. Thank you, Tara. And I think that gives us our quorum. So um, item C is approval out of the agenda. I vote to approve. Second. OK, that's a motion by Mike and seconded by Glenn. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. OK, the agenda is approved. Uh, approval of minutes from the February 18th, 2021 meeting. So moved. So moved. Uh, so so as a, I think a motion by Alder Johnson, seconded by Mike. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, minutes are approved, thank you. And we'll go to uh, regular business, uh, election of officers. We'd like to see, uh, looking for nominations for chair and vice chair. Don't everybody jump up at once. <laughs> well, if, I mean, it, it would seem to me that the logical uh, process would be the vice chair would take over that chair role. So I would nominate Mike if he is interested. I, I, I would be interested. Then that is a nomination. Okay. Are there any other nominations for chair? Any other nominations for chair? Last time, any other nominations for chair? If and would you a second for that, please? Okay. Okay, second that. Thank you, Tara. Can we go ahead and uh, all in favor of um, Mr. Piot becoming our chair, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Congratulations, Mr. Chair. Glad to have you on. <laughs> uh, looking for a uh, for, uh, nomination for vice chair. It's like being the, it's like it's like being the backup kicker, guys. There's not a lot yeah. of job, not a lot of responsibility for this one. So <laughs> every once in a while, right. we might need you if Mike's not available. So okay, I guess I'll uh, I'll self um, nominate myself if okay. no one else is up for the pass yet. Motion for Tara. Assuming she can, I think yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, I can I have a second on that. I'll second. Okay, Mike seconds. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? If not, we have a motion for Tara to be to become uh, vice chair. Can I have uh, all the ayes if in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Perfect. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Tara. We appreciate your service. Thank you. We will go on to uh, section E, item two, uh, consideration of possible action on the commercial uh, Real estate market study. So, Wendy, do you want to tee this one up first, or do you want to go and turn it right over to Manny? So, um, the EDA has been aware that we have the study to be able to bring forward. And as you know, we consulted with um, uh, Manny um, here, and he's here to speak um, for this. And he um, represents NAI Pfefferly. And um, I do have that report. It was in the packet as well. Um, I don't know if we should. I don't know if Manny wants me to bring that up and I can share my screen um, for you to talk about it or how we want to proceed. Sure, this is Manny. Good. Open the floor as well. Yeah, good evening, everyone. You, you tell me what works better, Wendy. If, uh, planning to just go over some of the key takeaways and some highlights and then turn it over for questions, but whatever works better for you. Can we get a motion sure. to open the we, floor? Um, get a motion to open the floor. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Do you want me to start? 
Uh, we need to have somebody Motion say to that. Open the floor for interested parties. Can we have a second on that, please? Okay, I'll second. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay. Any, uh, all in favor of motion to of opening the floor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, Manny, we've got, looks like uh, Wendy has your, has the report up the PDF on there so we can refer to any, uh, any section you would like us to. With, with that, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, everybody. But I, I won't read lengthy report. So when you are having trouble sleeping um, in the next couple of weeks, please pull it up and <laughs> hopefully that, sh that should help. Uh, it's about 100 pages long. I'm not going to go over the whole thing. Um, I just thought I would go over some, some highlights. Um, just to step back, our, our firm is a commercial real estate firm uh, headquartered in Appleton with offices in, in Green Bay as well. Uh, so we know the commercial market really well. Uh, we focused our report on four major property types. Uh, those are office, industrial, retail, and multifamily. So throughout the report, you'll see those um, kind of have their own chapter and a lot of data per, per section. Um, the focus of the report was on the Green Bay, the greater Green Bay area or the Green Bay region. So Brown County is probably the best um, way to describe that. It's, um, you know, obviously the city of Green Bay and the surrounding communities as well. Um, so if you go to page six of the final report uh, titled Key Findings, I'll just go through these few pages here with you um, and again, let you review do this easier and also take questions if there are any. Um, so with the office market, um, one of the biggest takeaways with office uh, was the increasing number of vacancies or rate of vacancies in, in the market. Um, but if we look at data, and again, if you dig deeper in the report, you'll see that large office vacancies came into the market way before COVID. Uh, and that's something that we're seeing. Really. COVID-19 is definitely expediting trends, office trends, and remote work trends that were already here prior to COVID, uh, but not, now are, are certainly moving much quicker and, and are here to stay. Uh, so three buildings come to mind. Uh, these will be familiar to all of you, I take it. Uh, Shopco's former headquarters in Ashwaubenon, uh, WPS's campus, downtown Green Bay, and United Health's building uh, in Howard. Uh, those three properties combined account for roughly a million square feet of office space, which is about 10% of the entire office inventory in Brown County. Uh, so with those three large properties uh, and, and you know, vacancies or soon to be vacancies, that raises a red flag um, sitting on a lot of empty office spaces, not good for any community. Uh, but the good news is that compared to other larger markets uh, like your Chicago's, Minneapolis, et cetera, we're not hearing from a lot of companies locally who are saying we wanna eliminate our office space completely. Uh, the trend we think is going to be a reduction of the office footprint. You know, it's going to look and feel differently. It's probably going to be smaller in some cases, uh, but we've only heard of three, maybe four or five companies so far, that is, uh, who have told us we are planning to shut down our office building completely and work remotely completely. Uh, so we think that's a key point. Uh, you know, the, the office market will change regardless of where you are um, and, and it, we, are, we are seeing those changes already but we don't we're not ringing the alarm bell just yet hey Manny could I ask a question on that point yes go ahead uh, Brian uh, thanks by the way for, for presenting on this um, knowing that you're behind it I have no doubt it is uh, going to be exceptional so I appreciate you being here um, one of the questions I have though in the, in the spirit of talking about mean versus median and you see 1.2 million of square feet uh, available for lease, 900,000 tied up in three properties. So that would leave, um, you know, 300,000 square feet uh, for the rest of the city. So I'm just curious your perspective on 300,000 versus 1.2 million and how that translates into uh, the current market demand. Yeah, so it, it's tricky when we, when we pull reports on what's 
currently listed for lease, it doesn't always imply that those are vacant buildings, first of all, because I could list my building, my office building for lease while it's still occupied, but I have, for example, a lease coming up for expiration, so I'm getting ready for that. Uh, so it's, it's a little tricky. Um, it also doesn't necessarily mean that every building that's listed that hit our radar screen is captured on that data set. There could be buildings that are available that are not being listed for lease, if that makes sense, Brian. So it's, it's kind of a combination of all of that. Um, I think to, to answer your question, you know, we're not seeing we're not seeing a whole lot of vacant office space in Brown County. We're just not. I think, you know, those three buildings that, that you just you just repeated, they certainly throw off the data quite a bit because they're so large. And we have a number of class B, class C office space in the market. But with the exception of, of those three buildings, you know, we don't have a lot of empty vacancies. Now, what we are seeing vacant is kind of the medium, small to medium sized office building, the, you know, five to 15 to 20,000 square foot buildings. Those may have some vacancies if it's multi-tenant, um, but we're just not seeing a whole lot of large office buildings that are vacant. Yeah, and I appreciate that insight. And it's it wasn't meant to necessarily punch a hole in the conclusion, but, you know, I even right. think of a, a property like WPS. I mean, are they yeah. authentically trying to lease? Or, I mean, you know, I think they're really trying to pursue a redevelopment of that site. So I don't even know that I would, you know, include them in that lease discussion. Um, that's a but, great, that's a great point. That's a great point. I, I have seen a marketing sheet uh, from their organization with information about the site and, you know, the acreage and details like that. As far as how actively are they, are they marketing the property? That I, I don't know. I mean, we, you know, we see some literature floating around, but we haven't seen just in my, in, this is my opinion, I haven't seen an aggressive marketing plan uh, hit my, my desk at least, or our shop's desk uh, with more information on that. So uh, yeah, and that's another degree of complexity, right? If something's being listed, how, how actively is it being listed? Where can I find those listings if I'm looking for office space and I don't live in Green Bay? Uh, so there's kind of a series of, of factors there. And Paul Johnson, if I could also throw in, there, in terms of, I think, you know, while we all think, you know, redevelopment is certainly a significant potential, it probably won't be marketed as such until there's some sort of agreement uh, with us at the city, I would imagine. <laughs> now, certainly, we're going to be required to be a player in part of that. So, uh, at some point, point, there's going to be a requirement that if they're, that's a the road they're going to be going on, so that there should be some active conversations, hopefully, with staff at that point before they really commit to going down that road. But uh, so probably, they're probably, point, hedging, they're probably hedging their bets a little bit right now in terms of going, you know, at least making it available. But I, I think that uh, I agree with your point that most the most likely path for that one is probably some degree, some sort of redevelopment, I believe, on that site. Good point, Neil. Right. The site, as, as I know, uh, is being marketed for sale right now as, as a an entire property, all, you know, all of the, the acreage combined, but uh, correct. It, it's been, you know, I, I think they're just waiting to see how the market reacts to that offering and, and kind of go from there. Um, so I'll, I'll just keep going here in, in the essence of time. Um, not a whole lot of difference between the local office market and what we're seeing nationally with the exception again of, um, you know, the fact that we have a lower cost market um, and we don't live in downtown Chicago or Manhattan and then these other markets that are, are hit, have been hit extremely hard. Um, we, we anticipate that COVID will have an, object, uh, an impact on the office market, but not to the extent of those other larger metro areas. Uh, bear with me here. I'm just pulling down the the report. So again, working from home trends, nothing new. A number of employers were already investing in technology and the ability for their employees to work remotely whenever they choose. I think what COVID is doing is it's almost forcing <laughs> employers to be more flexible if they weren't already. Those who were on board already just flipped the switch and their employees were able to work from home and look into um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I think those companies who kind of resisted that a little bit more in the past have been forced to 
uh, you know, kind of see the writing on the wall and, and at least be okay or supportive of employees working from uh, home or remotely uh, for a period of, of time. Uh, so we, we expect to see that uh, certainly going forward. Flexibility is going to be key. Um, and, you know, we threw some, something here that, that we've heard before, and that's the opportunity, I think, that lies with the city of Green Bay and the state of Wisconsin as a whole. And this might sound like a stretch, I know, but um, some experts think and economic development folks think that with COVID, the allure of larger markets and gateway cities like your San Francisco's and Chicago's and you know even uh, Minneapolis will diminish and secondary and tertiary cities and markets like Green Bay will flourish because of the lower cost of living and the higher quality of life. So if I'm an employee and I'm working virtually permanently and I used to live in suburban Chicago and I'm not commuting to my office anymore, would I find it appealing to move somewhere else like to Green Bay, keep my job and my salary and live in the peace and quiet of Northeast Wisconsin? Uh, so there, there might be something there and I don't know what that looks like, but I think to me, it's a pretty attractive value proposition that we just need to, we, we just need to go after and, and pursue, I, I think as, as a state and maybe as a region. So again, Sounds like a stretch. I don't know how many people are going to leave Chicago just because of COVID. I think the point, though, is do we have now an even more attractive value prop to those other employers and employees who are, who are living in larger communities and, and paying more on rent and cost of living, et cetera? So something to think about there. You know, um, I'm going to chime in just real quick. This is Terry here. Um, I yeah. can attest to that because some of our customers, we're seeing a lot of customers um, gravitating towards the Door County area or kind of just the um, suburbs of Green Bay. And they're coming from California, from, um, I even have two from, where was it, Dallas. Um, they're here because it was the pandemic and they can work from home. So they, they're they here. So they, they don't have family. It's just here there's recreational things that they like to do up north and, you know, nearby here. So, I mean, I definitely think that that is, you know, um, something that we should look out for and um, kind of see how we can um, maximize on that potential of bringing these um, groups into our region. So I'm with you, Tara. As a follow-up to that, this is Mike. Um, how would uh, Green Bay, Brown County promote this? How do we get the word out that this is a great place to be uh, as opposed to your big city? Uh, that's a great question, Mike. And that's a great follow-up. I think, in my opinion, and I'll let Wendy and, and Neil and, and team speak to this, in my opinion, what that looks like is continuing to work with the Green Bay Chamber of Commerce and their economic development program that markets Brown County, uh, both for business retention and attraction, but also for talent recruitment. Uh, you know, supporting the new north and anything going on at the regional level. Um, and I think, I think this exercise is done best in my experience when we look at the region uh, and when we can market more density, more assets, um, rather than going, going at it solo. But I'll, I'll let Neil and, and Wendy speak to this. Yeah, I think one thing I would add to that is I think getting, uh, getting our things back open safely is obviously a, a huge advantage. I think we're going to be, do, be able to do that faster than a larger urban areas. I think we're going to be able to get our, our events and our quality of life things back up and operating faster than in large urban areas. I think those are the things we need to showcase and show off a little bit. And certainly the business environment, all the standard things that we normally compete on have to still stay part of what we do. But I think the, the added X factor, I think, is showing our ability to be resilient and to come back faster uh, from, from the COVID-19 restrictions that we're facing and actually getting a, a functioning local you know, local kind of quality of life back in place. I think that's where we can really show our edge in a lot of areas. So, um, you know, I think you know, anything we can do to accelerate that safely, obviously still want to be doing it safely, but we're going to be able to be much more nimble and much faster, I think, than anybody really uh, in any of those larger markets. And I think one thing I would add, and this is to complement what Tara mentioned, you know, we have a realtor that, that has an office next door to mine 
and she's currently working with six different clients who are looking to relocate to Green Bay simply because they can. And that's just one realtor, right? So, so the, I think there's definitely an opportunity there. Now, now to Mike's question, and Ma Manny alluded to this, who's best positioned to do that? Now we had a, sort of a workshop, EDA workshop at our last meeting talking about what does the future of EDA look like? You know, to my knowledge, we really don't have any uh, commission, authority or committee at the city level that's really talking about talent. And, and I think there's an opportunity there for EDA, but I would also add that this is a core competency of the Greater Green Bay Chamber, as well as the New North. So I don't think we need to usurp anything that they're doing, but we can certainly be doing things that complement uh, and enhance what they're right. doing. But I think they're, they're the perfect organizations to lead that conversation. Very good. I'll keep going. If there aren't any more questions on the office market, again, more more information on your um, in, in the report itself, you'll see a, a actually to, to Brian's point, um, WPS is a site downtown Green Bay. There's a small rendering on the bottom of page eight um, that that kind of shows you know the mixed use um, approach to that site. So we'll we'll kind of stay tuned and see what that what that looks like. Um, so the industrial market, uh, section two of the report, um, what I can say here, again, I don't want to take too much time uh, from your meeting. What I can say about the industrial market is uh, that it's hot. <laughs> uh, industrial nationally has been performing very, very well locally uh, as well. Um, I think this, this really is a, a, one of the, 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 the testaments to uh, the strength of our manufacturing um, uh, uh, sector in, in Northeast Wisconsin and Brown County, uh, you know, 22% of the workforce in the region is in manufacturing, which is two and a half times the national average. So uh, this is what we do. We do it well. And our folks in manufacturing have, for the most part, um, been in really good health uh, and, and shape through COVID. Uh, most of them were deemed essential businesses. So they were able to keep their doors open and their employees um, working for, again, for the most part. Um, with, with some delays and, and setbacks. But once uh, that opened up a bit, it's amazing to see how unemployment in Brown County went from, I think it was 13% or something like that, maybe 12, uh, down to, you know, four and a half to five, uh, just in a matter of a few months. And I think a big part of that was the, the strength of the manufacturing sector. In addition to our manufacturers doing well and needing industrial space, hence the, the industrial sector doing so well, uh, the e-commerce boom, which we're all very familiar with. Uh, and, you know, the Amazon effect is real. Uh, not only Amazon, but a whole lot of other companies who are beefing up their e-commerce platforms. That calls for additional distribution and warehouse space. Companies need more space to store all of this inventory before they get delivered to their customers. So DCs or distribution centers are popping up all over the place. This here too, I think, is an opportunity for, for the city of Green Bay. Um, logistically, you know, being located um, on, on a highway, on an interstate with a number of assets nearby uh, and access to labor, which is probably the number one criteria for selecting sites and buildings right now. Um, Green Bay has a lot to offer. Uh, there's a lot of density. There's a lot of what companies are looking for, great quality of life, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, we expect the city of Green Bay and Brown County to continue to be a great spot for distribution centers and warehouse type of pro uh, type property. Um, just going, th going through this here, um, you know, I think one recommendation that came out of this, we're starting to see some municipalities in the state do this in, in the country too, um, is to think strategically and think long-term about your land availability for industrial development um, you know, a number of communities are looking at how much industrial park land do we have available for sale right now if we've got a phone call from a company who needed, you know, 40 acres to build something. Do we need more? What's the perfect balance, right? And, and that's kind of a, a healthy discussion to have. Um, I think with the historically low vacancy rates with the industrial market, we're at like 2% vacancy or something like that. Um, there's a real opportunity for local developers and also from out of town develop out of state developers um, to build on spec or semi spec. Uh, and we're starting to see that level of interest come into the into the marketplace, which is really exciting. 
when we get phone calls from developers from Minneapolis or Indianapolis or Chicago, um, we, we like those calls. That means that we're hitting their radar screens and they're asking the right questions to, to us. Um, Manny, I think I one of the takeaways. On that. Yeah, yeah, you, please, you know, please when do. We first, uh, it, as, a, uh, as an authority, when we first discussed commissioning this report, um, in, industrial spec building was one of those topics that I had kind of floated out there and we were looking you know, for a report that could potentially reinforce or dismiss that notion. Um, so I really yeah. appreciate the data in here and the example that I was drawing from, and this is a little bit for Neil's benefit since this conversation occurred prior to his arrival, um, but we had done a, a study trip with the Chamber of Commerce um, to the city of Louisville. And, uh, you know, Kelly Armstrong, Paul Everett, uh, Mayor Genrick, I believe was, no, he might've been the Kansas City one. Uh, but, but anyway, there, there were a bunch of community leaders on that one. Um, and, and there was a scenario, Neil, that I think would be worth talking to Kelly about. Uh, where in Louisville, they, they had done basically a spec industrial park. Now it didn't start out to spec the whole thing. It just snowballed out of control uh, because it was so successful. <laughs> you know, and the idea is to take your industrial parks uh, where you have land maybe that's underdeveloped and you're meeting a need that exists in the community that the private sector uh, just wasn't filling for whatever reason. And I think, um, you know, to Manny's point, if we're, if we're getting those calls from that developers, it's always better if the private sector can, can take that on. But even if there's, you know, a hybrid option that can be explored for us to, uh, you know, to, to how do we close this gap? I mean, because we're all on these lists, uh, these are, you know, economic development folks, we're on these lists where we get these requests, requests for proposals for industrial users who are looking for uh, space that's already built out and it just doesn't exist here. And that's, that's a real tragedy because as a community, we're missing out on opportunities to have these businesses locate or expand in our city. So I, I think that that's a really important component we need to be ready to explore. And, and, I, and I do appreciate that, Alder Johnson. I would like to say that I think we are starting to see the private market react to that a little bit. Um, I think we actually have a couple of, of local builders who are actually looking in the area uh, about possibly building spec space for the first time that far I can see for in quite, quite some time. And that's been a statewide issue. That's not just been uh, really something here in Green Bay. That's not unique to here. It's, you know, what, ever since the, the recession in 2008, folks have not been real excited about wanting to go out and try to borrow and finance projects without having tenants. Um, but the market has gotten so tight and the demand has gotten so high that I think we're starting to see that change a little bit. So um, I think right now, you know, I agree, Alder Johnson, our first position is to try to support the private sector and any efforts they might be doing on that. But at some point, if there's a specific sector or something that we decide we really have an interest in as a city, we may want to take a little bit more of an aggressive approach at some point. And I think this, the EDA here is probably a great group to kind of vet that, that concept through as it goes through. Right, right. Great discussion, thank you. Um, okay, I'll keep, I'll keep things moving if that's okay. Uh, we'll jump into the retail market. Uh, section three, it starts on page 12, the, the key takeaways uh, for this segment. Um, again, e-commerce uh, is impacting traditional brick and mortar stores, nothing that you didn't already know. Um, we're expecting many more store shutdowns uh, in 2020 mostly in malls and large retail centers. Again, nothing new there. Um, I think one of the, the things that I'm, I'm encouraged by, to be honest, is to see the city think ahead, uh, picking on our malls for a minute here. Um, you know, this is a, a national phenomenon. This is not a Green Bay problem, uh, but malls are changing. Um, you know, our firm has a number of large big box stores listed for lease and sale all over the, the country, or excuse me, the, the state. Uh, and, and it's a challenge, uh, without a doubt. Um, we have, a, you know, spaces ranging from uh, 1,000 square feet to 120,000 square feet. And, um, uh, and, and it, this, is a, this is a segment that is continue, it will continue to change. Um, Amazon and e-commerce are not going anywhere. I think it's important, again, to think outside the box, pun intended, when the city and your group is looking at potential um, uses and, um, you know, looking at, at the permitting, zoning, and anything that makes the use or potential use more flexible, more in demand, 
uh, I think is really important. Uh, redevelopment opportunities of older retail sites um, is also something to put on our radar. Um, what we're seeing on, on this front, you're not gonna be shocked by this, is shorter leases um, by retail tenants. Uh, asking their landlords for more and, you know, they have all the leverage right now. So uh, we're going to continue to see those kind of deals um, hit the market as well. Um, I think something that will hit the infrastructure of the city, uh, not again, not just Green Bay, but everyone in the country is that this growth in the, in the demand for delivery services will just continue to shape uh, the retail marketplace and I think we'll continue to challenge our roads, um, our, um, you know, our semi uh, traffic patterns and, and all of this, right? So it's all kind of one, one big bubble that's, that's here and that's here to stay. And I've heard real estate experts say that the brick and mortar experience though, isn't going away altogether, similar to what the office is for employees. You know, the office for employees is a place to build community and collaborate and communicate, problem solve together the physical store, the retail space is also an experience and an opportunity to try something on or to, you know, kick the tires on something that you're going to, you're, you're looking to buy. Um, so I think there's, there's going to be a space and a place for that. It's just going to probably look different to, you know, the traditional mall with a number of tenants inside and, you know, a massive campus. It's, it's just, it's going to change. Um, any questions or thoughts about the retail market? Again, nothing earth shattering here, I don't think. Hey, Manny, this is Neil again. In terms of looking at um, the specific types of uses, are you going? Are we going to see an like an increase in the attractiveness of more service uses, things like um, you know barber shops, nail salons, um, hmm. you know things where you can act, you actually have to physically show up and be in person? Are those going to increase in, in demand in the market in terms from a real estate standpoint? Because those are the things that are actually going to generate traffic now, as opposed to retail that may or may not, depending on how they compete with an online market? That's a great question, Neil. So what we're seeing is hardware stores are doing really well. Um, wellness and health and gyms, now that they're starting to open up, I think people are sick of working out at home. <laughs> so, and, you know, jogging outside. So I think those are going to get some people back. Um, health and, and kind of, I'll, I'll throw beauty, barbershops, salons, uh, there too, I think that there's this pent up demand. I've heard that I don't love this term, but I've heard revenge shopping thrown out there <laughs> where people are just, you know, saving money for over a year and not being able to physically go to the store or get your hair done or your nails done, whatever it is you do. Uh, so then the demand for these kind of services are going to, you know, are going to increase um, because people are just ready for to, to go back out there. Um, so I don't know if that's going to be long term, though, Neil, and I don't know what, you know, who the winners or, or, and losers will be. Um, but I think that, you know, I think of Target, for example, right? Target has been having record months throughout the pandemic. And, you know, a lot of their competitors are doing the opposite. So, you know, what make, makes Target so special? And I, I don't know. I'm not a retail expert when it comes to like the shopping experience and the way they inventory and distribute. And, um, but I think as a trend overall, Target is also the company that's moving the fastest on this new distribution centers and warehouse spaces. Hence, they're cutting down delivery times for their consumers. So they wanna compete with Amazon. If Amazon's promising free overnight delivery, Target is saying, we wanna do that too. And let's figure out a way to do that. So. You know, Target is Target. They're massive. So I don't expect, you know, Target to dictate what the real ticket market, market is going to look like. But I think we're going to see more, even smaller retailers cater more to the um, online shopper, to the curbside pickup, to the click and grab type of trend. Uh, so I think those folks are, are going to do well. Manny, just a quick question for you. Uh, um, you know, and I think you, you mentioned the East Town Mall in here as an example, and I think it's a great example of where, you know, you're going to have to start to look at uh, rezoning uh, certain types of facilities for alternative uses. And in fact, when I learned of the plan of what was happening at East Town Mall, very coincidentally saw an article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, which aligned with the plan over there, which was to convert a lot of these, uh, these malls into uh, manufacturing space or, or hybrid 
spaces because that's how you make them financially viable. Fortunately for Green Bay, right. I, don't, I don't know that we've got a whole lot of malls that would need to be addressed in this manner. Um, I think that kind of falls to maybe Schwabenon and uh, elsewhere, but uh, th just a comment on, on that one. Uh, but then secondarily, one thing I didn't really see mentioned in the retail market component was uh, market demand for micro retail or co-op spaces. What are mm -hmm. you seeing in that, in mm -hmm. that area? Mm -hmm. So it, it's schools out on that. I think when I've traveled around, around the country and, and even just in the Midwest, you know, to larger towns, um, you walk into some of these, in, in fact, um, older warehouse buildings in some cases, and you see a number of vendors, um, you know, renting, probably renting space to sell whatever they sell in these kind of communal um, common area type um, uh, places. You know, other than, than like a public market type of a setup, I just haven't seen a lot of that locally. Um, I think I'm a fan. Personally, I like going to the Milwaukee public market. And you know, it's kind of neat because you have, again, to your point, Brian, multiple retailers, food included, and you can just kind of take your pick. It's kind of like the, the, new, the new cool, um, uh, you know, food court at the mall, right? Um, but locally, I'm, I'm just not seeing a whole lot of that. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm missing those. The, the same, somebody asked me recently, the same uh, applies to co-working space on an office um, side. Um, you know, we see that trend um, become popular even before COVID. And maybe that's now hurting because of COVID. But pri prior to the pandemic, you know, we work in all these, um, these companies doing really well with co-working space. I we just haven't seen a whole lot of that stick yet. Um, now, do we think, do I think we have a, a great opportunity to bring some of that into the community? Absolutely. And I think people are gravitating toward those kind of places. And I also think that that brings, maybe it's chicken or the egg, but that also goes really well with, you know, high density multifamily, right? And the ability to walk somewhere close to where you live, uh, you know, get some groceries or buy whatever you want to buy and then go back home. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I maybe I, we didn't include it because we haven't seen a whole lot of it yet locally, but I I think it's it's right but for, for the picking if, if we want to focus on it. I think I would add to that, Manny, I think in terms of opportunities that provide uh, additional support for those kind of micro businesses and whether that be marketing, administration, you know, building support, you know, if they provide some more of the support infrastructure where they can literally just focus on selling their product, I think those, those opportunities have a, a significantly more, uh, more realistic opportunity to be successful. Uh, when they're not worried about all the other things that a normal bricks and mortar site has to worry about in terms of property maintenance, leases, all those other things. So something that actually has, uh, you know, some of more of the support built right in, I think actually has a little bit more of a chance of, of attracting some of those smaller retailers. Yeah. And I think the reason I, I bring it up is I, I'm thinking about the shipyard, of course. I mean, the, the, that whole plan yeah. is based on the foundation of micro retail. But then I also think about yeah. even, though, even in the Broadway district corridor, by way of example, it, the smaller storefronts are the ones that get leased up the fastest. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, anytime yeah. you have a larger footprint, those are a little slower to lease up. And, and so it just makes you wonder, there's not a lot of inventory right now of those smaller spaces. How do you, you know, is the, so that's why I'm asking if there's demand for it. And if you can convince, you know, some of these larger spaces to, um, you know, parcel up a little bit, could there be some effectiveness there? I see. I see. I, I think I, I understand now, Brian, I, I think I was misunderstanding your question a little bit and just picturing in my head, I went to public market right away, but you're thinking more, but that's an example, retail footprint. That's an example. Yes. But but I think to your point, something that we are seeing is in the CBDs, I'm thinking of downtown Appleton, for example, and, and the same will apply to most of our downtowns in the region. Those phone calls that we're getting from retail tenants looking to lease retail space in the CBD are looking for smaller space than they were in the past, right? So that goes hand in hand with your comment that yes, that's the trend now, no more for the most part, no more large 100,000 square foot big box stores like we used to have, you know, the Shopkos, the Yonkers, the Mace, all of these. Uh, now the trend is more, let's go for experience, um, convenience. Let's have a great online platform to go with that. 
uh, and let's be where the action is near apartments and you know other shopping uh, options, but let's have a smaller footprint. Um, so I think that's that's the trend. But yeah, and even I think of just locally a place like City Deck Landing or the Metro, where they've probably had a hard time. You know, new facilities they've had a hard time leasing out their spaces, but they're still looking at you know five, six, seven thousand square foot spaces. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, and I get like managing more tenants is harder and it's always better to land the bigger fish, but just seems like those bigger fish aren't as bountiful perhaps as they used to be. I agree. I agree with you. In fact, our job when we're working with landlords and they have this kind of space is to challenge them and help them, right? See what the trends are in the marketplace. And we've had to do that a lot in the past year, year and a half, uh, challenging and pushing them saying, you know, if we, if we keep your, your space on the market and it's 116,000 square feet of single story retail, we're probably going to keep waiting for a while if we're just going after that single tenant. So let's think creatively here and let's open it up for other opportunities. So absolutely, I, I agree with that, Brian. Okay, so that's retail. And just to wrap it up here, um, multifamily, at, now, now, the city of Green Bay commissioned a, um, a really good housing study recently from MSA. So we didn't want to duplicate or, you know, go, go too, too deep into this, this um, uh, property market or property segment, uh, seeing that you just took out a, an extensive um, housing study. But uh, just, again, uh, some highlights, um, the mixed use trend, which we're we're seeing around the region. Um, I don't think this is anything new to the city of Green Bay. I've seen, in fact, I think the city of Green Bay is ahead of the curve uh, compared to Appleton and Nina and, and other communities to your south uh, when it comes to mixed use. Now, one piece on the retail side with the mixed use product type is if you can picture a mixed use building that's typically retail or office on the first floor street level and apartments usually up top or office or a combination of, of things. Um, typically locally, what we're seeing is that small retail, smaller typically retail suite on the first floor tends to take a while to lease up. This is kind of touches on what Brian was talking about. The apartments may be fine and the, uh, and the building might be full, but some of those retail pieces on the first floor are tricky. Uh, maybe they're too expensive on a per square, a per, uh, square foot basis. Maybe parking isn't as great uh, or the visibility or, or what have you. Um, but that's, that's kind of one, one thing I, I thought I would throw that out there. Um, I think despite COVID, our downtowns, um, you know, our, our Broadway district, our, uh, um, all of the amenities packed regions and districts within Brown County that we have, um, I think they're going to be just fine. You know, it, it's it's been really tough to watch um, kind of the, the health of our, of our downtowns uh, take a hit because of COVID and everything shut down and and people not wanting to shop and dine and, and et cetera and hang out in the downtown. But I think long term, that's still where people want to be. That's I'm gonna I'm gonna dig my my heels on on, on the sand here. Um, I think the apartment boom is going to continue. We, as the study itself shows for Green Bay, need a whole lot more units to catch up. The same is true for Northeast Wisconsin. The same is true for the entire state of Wisconsin. Uh, we're living through a very serious gap in housing and housing in general from single to multi. Um, so, uh, so that's a great opportunity in our hands, but it's also something that the city should, and I know you are, uh, be, be concerned with is how do we bring more affordable units? How do we bring more workforce housing, more, you know, market rate, mixed use type of housing, more single? I mean, it's, it's, we just need everything. Um, so uh, again, nothing you didn't already know, um, but that's also included on, on the report. So with that, I know I took longer than I said I was going to, so I apologize, um, but um, I'll leave it up, up to you for more questions or uh, or any final comments? Very, very interesting. Thank you, Mandy. For Mike, any more follow-up questions, please. Uh, my contact information is is on the report and Wendy and, and Neil have it as well. So feel free to reach out to me. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. All right.
right, so let's get back to our agenda. I don't know if there's necessarily, we, I think we, we, if we want to, I don't you think we need them. close the floor. Oh, that's right. Okay. We have a, floor. thank you. Could we have a second on that, please? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Mike. Right here. And then uh, we'll also need a motion to receive and place on file. Yep, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we have a motion to close the floor. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Yeah, I have in place on file. Can we have a second on that, please? I'll second. We have a motion and a second to receive the report and place it on file. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Perfect. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, next item on the agenda is consideration with possible action on the, whoops and possible action on the shared corridor vision report. I'm going to turn that over to Matt Buchanan, if I could, please. Matt, you got to look at Matt's. Looks like he's trying to get his all his stuff turned on here. Is the, there, look, there he is. So, Matt, on the Matt, the floor is yours once uh, you, everything gets turned on here. All right. Let's see here. Okay, hopefully you're looking at a full, full uh, PowerPoint. All right, so tonight <clears throat> we're looking for comments and possible approval of our shared corridor vision report. Um, this is a report that provides recommendations to help our downtown streets more accommodating to the business community, uh, which is why we felt it's appropriate to bring through EDA uh, for approval. Uh, a primary impetus for this document was the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, during the, the last year, um, during the early stages of the pandemic, the city worked to identify really a number of ways to support businesses. Uh, we provided emergency grants and loans to businesses. Uh, we also charged, uh, changed some of the policies uh, we've got to give businesses more flexibility in expanding their operations outdoors and into the public uh, right, of where, right of way where it's appropriate. Um, we also approved a new parklet ordinance, uh, which allows for the installation of like a deck-like structure um, in a, a parking stall in the street. Um, so as we were, we were changing these policy, policies to accommodate businesses during the pandemic, we realized that businesses along some of our primary downtown commercial corridors really required some special attention. Um, in the downtown, we have a higher density of retail and food-oriented businesses. Uh, these are businesses that were hit especially hard during the pandemic. And uh, considering their location along these downtown corridors, they often have a very limited area of outdoor real estate to work with. Um, so our team was encouraged uh, by Mayor Genrek to work with a consultant uh, to provide guidance and develop a list of design recommendations uh, to help these businesses during, uh, during the pandemic, but also to look beyond the pandemic and develop some long-term strategies uh, to make our downtown streets more accommodating uh, for businesses, um, but also just to pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, so our team uh, uh, worked with uh, Tool Design Group. Uh, that was the group that was selected for this uh, project. Um, they were the group that we worked with um, recently on our safe walk plan, which is focused on bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure throughout the city. Um, so we felt it was appropriate to continue working with them since they have, um, since, uh, they already had a pretty good group grip on um, our, our infrastructure. Um, the corridors, let me advance my slide here. Uh, the corridors we focused on with, uh, with this scope of work was Broadway um, and Washington, um, really between Maine and then going down, um, uh, down south. Um, and then also the connector streets of Walnut and then Main Endowment. Um, the team conducted a 
a thorough, thorough examination of our existing conditions along these corridors. Sorry, here we go. Um, we also held multiple stakeholder meetings with staff of on Broadway, um, downtown Green Bay, as well as city staff from Public Works, uh, fire and police. Um, and from this work, um, the tool team prepared a list of recommendations. Um, and to summarize that list, um, of course, the full reports in the packet, but just a summary. Um, of course, we want to activate um, these streets, um, which the report identifies as kind of the city loop, which is that, that circular loop. Let me go back to this side, really connecting the two districts along Walnut, Broadway, Main, and then down on Washington. Um, we would activate them through encouraging parklets, um, outdoor dining and retail. Um, they also recommended we create these pickup and drop off zones for takeout and ride sharing taxi services as well. Um, they recommended we improve and expand our uh, pedestrians. Um, they recommended we promote connectivity between district city loop concept um, and also create pavement art and um, act also activate underutilized lots for flexible community spaces, outdoor dining or events. A lot of these recommendations are things we were already doing. Um, early last year um, during the pandemic, we, we um, activated the, the Adam Street parking lot for a temporary outdoor dining room with um, the downtown business improvement district. Um, we do um, have pickup and drop off zones for takeout and um, in the in the downtown, um, which we recently implemented. Um, and of course, we um, approved a parklet ordinance last year. Um, but really, these recommendations um, uh, provided a little bit more guidance um, to to really amp up these um, activities and just help us um, do a little bit better job with all of these things. So I'm going to show you a couple slides here that directly came from this, uh, this report, which really hone in on the two districts, Broadway and downtown. Um, you can see here where they have areas where they recommend um, as good locations for parklets to be located um, here in the green. Of course, this isn't a recommendation that this whole section of street parklets, but it, it's really just recommending that these are areas where um, parklets make great sense. They got those TNC uh, pick up and drop off zones, um, locations of pavement art, and recommendations also um, for uh, protected bike lanes. Um, we've got some bike lanes um, currently along uh, Dowsman Street um, in Maine, but they would recommend we take it up a notch uh, and actually have infrastructure to make these protected lanes. Going down to Washington Street, um, they identify locations for pavement art um, in some of the key intersections, um, of course, locations for, for parklets um, and activating some of these areas for, um, for flex space when appropriate. Uh, the document also includes a toolkit with examples and diagrams uh, to kind of help demonstrate how we may implement some of these concepts. So this here is just uh, one page out of the, the document that kind of shows um, uh, parklet concepts uh, and ways we can uh, activate those parklets with planters and, and um, heating and things like that. As well as uh, the document includes typical sections of these four streets, um, demonstrating how they look now here. This is Broadway um, with how it looks now and uh, how it would look with some of these concepts implemented. Um, so basically the, some of the primary changes would be um, um, activating some of these parking lanes for parklets, um, not just for cars, um, having um, more delineated bike lanes, um, and then of course, just providing more spaces for outdoor dining. 
here on Washington Street. We don't have quite as much room to work with, um, but they do recommend parklets um, in certain areas where appropriate. Um, still recommending Sharrows, which we currently have an outdoor dining space. Uh, Dousman Street has protected bike lanes as the primary change here, um, as opposed to our current um, Sharrows or um, unprotected bike lanes. So if this report is approved, um, our team would work to implement some of the lower hanging fruit right away. Um, lower hanging fruit in our minds is, is um, temporary or removable structures like parklets uh, and simple projects that can be completed with paint like uh, pavement art. Um, these are items that are relatively low cost and easy to implement. Um, some of the larger, more expensive items like protected bike lanes and wayfinding signage would be um, probably considered further on down the road um, when we can identify sources, funding sources for those projects. Um, uh, but yes, right away we would uh, look at implementing parklets um, through, um, it's, it's next on the agenda of course, but looking to do a, a parklet um, grant program. Um, that would happen after we finalize our parklet permit application process, which is nearing completion. And then we would also work with the Green Bay Public Arts Commission on um, some pavement art concepts. We have some, some funds identified to, to do these projects right away. Um, so we'd be hoping to get started on that here um, very, very soon. Um, any questions? Just if I could, Matt. Um, you know, when I saw this come through, by the way, you always do just such an amazing job, Matt, with working with the various consultants and putting these reports together. So really appreciate the hard work that you do on this front. Um, when I saw this report come out, I was both elated and discouraged. And let me explain that. Uh, elated because it reinforces some of the things that we already knew and that we've already been discussing locally. Um, I can't speak for downtown. I see Sally's on the call and perhaps we could open the floor for her to speak if that's in fact something that she wants to do. But uh, at least for the Broadway district, we have a master design plan and we also had a tech visit. Uh, and, and, and a lot of the things that were in this report were already contained in ours. So this will make, I'm just gonna call the elephant out in the room. This will make the third report, potentially the fourth report if you include authenticity, that's going to tell us some of the things that we need to do. At some point, we just need the funding to do the things that are being recommended. And so, uh, as we all know, um, federal government has indicated that there's about $25 million that they are going to be sending back to the municipality. So I don't see any reason why we wouldn't include this report uh, or approve this report tonight. But one of the things I think we need to do uh, is also include a rider uh, to refer this back to the mayor's office for strong, strong consideration and allocation of some of that funding um, for the implementation of the recommendations made in this plan. So you, you had brought up, you know, the, um, the parklets. That was actually a communication I submitted pre-COVID. Um, so, and, and it was because it was in our plan. Let's get, you know, let's get these things uh, implemented in our community. Uh, the city loop, I really like how they branded that. Uh, it, that's in our plan. We didn't have it branded, but it was in our plan. And it's something our uh, respective downtown bits have been talking about. That's a, exactly a one mile loop. Uh, across those bridges. And so it's a perfect like, hey, get out of the office, go for a walk, do a one mile walk during your lunch break uh, type of activity. Um, and, and one of the other things that we've oftentimes talked about is that um, the bridges, and they just seem to be these terrifying things that people don't want to cross. Um, so I like that they're talking about protected bike lanes. Um, I've often said that we need those walkways to be protected because from a pedestrian experience, it is not comfortable walking across those bridges with the traffic volume uh, that we're looking at. But I think you can take that even up a notch and you think about um, like hanging flower baskets on those rails, right? How do you make the, the space a little softer, less concrete, less industrial uh, impositions and, and more things that, that people wanna spend time around. Um, and, and so I, I really like the idea that they're making some recommendations. I think we can go a little further um, on those, those bridge crossings. Um, and then of course, so, like, I, again, 
to just address the elephant in the room, not only funding, but some of the things they're recommending in here are things we've been told we're not allowed to do. And you know, I'm talking specifically about the pavement art. We were told it's strictly forbidden, it's illegal. And now we have another organization from the outside telling us, no, it's not illegal. And here's uh, the code that says you can do it and how to do it. So I really hope that we can get over some of our internal hurdles uh, to allow us to implement some of these things. So those are my comments. Um, again, thanks for the hard work, Matt. Thank you, Brian, uh, or Alderman, sorry. Um, one of the, the great things about this document is we worked very closely with our partners in the, de the, the Department of Public Works on these recommendations. They approved each and every recommendation. Um, a lot of these recommendations were changed with their input, um, including the pavement art. So we actually have, and one of your recommendations was to um, send this back to the mayor's office to um, identify funding. Um, we have identified $40,000 already, um, $20,000 to create a Parkwood grant program, which we're gonna uh, uh, hopefully uh, consider here with our next agenda item, and then 20 for the pavement art program. Um, Laura Schley, our public arts coordinator, is already working with our, um, our public works staff on putting together uh, her request for art, a call for art, um, which will comply with the, what's called the MUTCD standards. I know you're familiar with that, Brian. Others might not be. It gets into the weeds a little bit with what the federal government identifies as um, approvable um, pavement uh, colors and patterns on pavement. Um, so we will be complying with those standards, um, and and I think everyone's on board and moving this one forward. Um, Neil, I saw you unmuted yourself. Did you have more to say on this? Just that, uh, and as we continue, even in developing the application materials and the review process, you know, we will continue to work with the Public Works Department on in ensuring that their that their you know their concerns have been been addressed. Um, again, they you know they are certainly looking at at protecting the infrastructure that is out there. We understand that. Uh, we think there there is a, there is a path forward to work collaboratively. We think all are in terms of making sure that we can make some of these improvements and still make sure we are protecting the infrastructure and the safety of of both pedestrians and vehicles on these roadways. We think there is a path forward on that. But um, yeah, certainly we'll be continuing to coordinate that with the public work staff as we proceed. Guys, could I jump in for a second? I don't know, can you hear me all right? Just, all right, yep. cool. Uh, this is Glenn uh, Sherman. I'd like to just kind of echo uh, what Brian said. Um, you know, the ideas in this report are very exciting. Uh, I would love to see a lot of them happen. Um, everything, every trend that we see right now, and it was talked about earlier, uh, is kind of trending towards uh, experience-based uh, things, whether they're experience-based small businesses, uh, experience-based housing where you're going to live, um, you know, you're on the trail, you're on the river, things like that. Um, you know, and I think that includes a city uh, experience as well. And these kinds of things add to to that experience. And I think it is important to focus on a downtown area uh, as an experience, uh, you know, especially in Green Bay, because let's face it, we're way behind uh, the Titletown district when it comes to uh, experience based stuff. Um, you know, they're out ahead of us. And, um, you know, for the city of Green Bay, uh, you know, I hate to see us uh, fall that far behind um, in some of these things. So I, I just want to. I echo what was said, but uh, that and uh, there's some planters down on Broadway that could a lot of uh, parklet space. The same. Yeah, thank you very much, Glenn. Um, appreciate those comments. I think um, Neil and Wendy, um, our whole economic development team, understands uh, you know the shift towards experience um, and you know years ago not that long ago actually you know economic development was all about jobs 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 now it's really about quality of life and creating these great experiences and um, making sure that our downtown and our whole city stays competitive by creating those kinds of great experiences and amenities it, it's all connected so that's definitely what this this report is um, guiding us uh, to 
to implement some of those concepts. So thank you. I, mean, I, I see Sally from downtown is on the call. If I could just get a thumbs up from her. I didn't know if she was here to talk on this issue. Uh, and if so, obviously I wanna be able to open the floor for her. If not, you know, not trying to impose it, but wanna give her that opportunity. Is that a thumbs up to open the floor, Sally? <laughs> I think I believe I'm going to assume that it is Brian. I think let's right. assume that it is. Oh no! Oh, thanks. she said no. Thanks. Okay. Never mind. Okay, we're good. Right. I just didn't okay. want to miss the opportunity if she was interested. Thank no, you. No, thank you, thank you, Alder, for pointing that out. So we do have uh, we do have someone raising their hand wishing to speak. So do we need a, do we need a motion then to open the floor? Yep, motion to open to do the that? floor for interested parties. Can we get a second on that, please? A second. That. Hey, we have motion to say. Could we all in favor, please, by, please respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, looks like a uh, gentleman's name is Mason Tipton. Looks like has his hand raised. Would like to speak. Oh, we put it. Number. You put it in chat. Okay. So. Uh, his comment, I'll just read this in case anybody sees. I noticed a bit about being more inviting to cyclists, and it made me think of something. Remember, remember that Lyme pulled out Green Bay, pulled out of Green Bay in 2019 or so. As we transition back to normal, could there be any potential plans to work with a similar company again? Actually, great question, Mason. If it's okay, uh, Mr. Chair, I will go ahead and answer that question. Um, actually, the city has been contacted by an alternative vendor with an interest in bringing scooters into Green Bay. Um, what's we, we find the idea very interesting and I know we our, our attorney's office was actually in the middle of working on an ordinance update related to these types of kind of alternative transportation modes, uh, more, more localized transportation. Um, we're kind of in the point of probably getting that, hopefully bringing that or getting that ordinance completed here within the next month or so. Uh, and once we do that, probably determining, uh, do we want to actually do like a competitive RFP process and try to recruit these types of uses? Again, I think the staff's preliminary reaction was, uh, we think the scooters are interesting, but we're looking for somebody maybe that could bring scooters, bikes, e-bikes, a little bit more wider spectrum of, of options uh, to the city, whether that's through a single vendor or through multiple vendors. Uh, so we actually are going to be pursuing and taking a look at um, the possibility of how that might still be, be a part of some of the infrastructure things in the discussion we are having right now. So uh, great question is uh, he follows up with, would UWGB be included in that as well as like we were with Lyme? Absolutely. Uh, I think the university, you know, one thing we want to do, uh, certainly the opportunity for all those students is making sure that we do have, they are, the UWGB is a part of this community. <laughs> we want to make sure that we've got opportunities, uh, you know, both for their students and their faculty uh, to basically be interacting and have some opportunities, whether that be through trails and other connections uh, and other infrastructure. So absolutely, uh, we'd be reaching out and including them. So Neil, if I could further expand on that, um, because I think a lot of people maybe aren't fully aware of why Lyme pulled out of Green Bay. Um, you know, it was really at, at, at the time that they secured additional funding really to focus on e-bikes and, and scooters. And they recognize, you know, that's where uh, the profitable line is. And so at, unfortunately at the time, the state of Wisconsin prohibited um, uh, those types of, of units. And so the state legislature took action on that, which, which legalized their use in the state of Wisconsin. In fact, Matt, you may recall this. I think it was literally like the day after I submitted uh, a communication um, to have our uh, city attorneys draft a mobility ordinance that would define how those things would be emergency on that because there just hasn't been a company ready to enter the Green Bay market. Um, but I did reach out to the city attorney's office, I believe last week. And, and to your point, Neil, they did confirm that they're actively working on that now, probably because we have somebody interested. So uh, I, I anticipate that that will come forward soon and trust that you guys um, will obviously bring in a company that can offer a multitude of options because um, th there are a variety of options out there. It's not just the pedal bikes. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this issue? Yeah, actually, I wanted to jump in um, uh, to talk a little bit more about the parklets and um, just kind of um, see if we can dive a little bit deeper into it. I don't know if this is a far stretch of a question, but um, I was wondering, you know, when it comes down to the um, getting the parklets up and going, um, I, I know that you guys talked about a little bit about make, making some grants available. Um, so I assume that the business can apply for that. And then the equipment that they purchase using that or the space that they develop. Um, 
you know, if they were to shut down the business um, after a while, who would own that, those, um, that, pro- that, those equipments. And then also if there were to be damage, because, you know, just that, that area and just the downtown area in general has, you know, plenty of bars. And so, you know, there's lots of things happening at night. And so if things were to get damaged, who would be liable for that? I just offer up a, a point of order, Chairman. I, I think the question is a good one, um, but I think it relates more to the next agenda item. And so it's, it's if, if I'm not mistaken, it might be better to perhaps dispense of this item first. Um, and, and then we can answer that question, I think, as part of the parklet discussion, if that's okay uh, with, with Ms. Yang. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. In which case, then, I, th- I think we did officially open the floor for interested parties. Uh, I would make a motion to close the floor. Second. Okay, Homer Johnson with the motion, uh, Mike with the second. Um, any other comments on this? If not, a uh, motion to close the floor is the moment. Please, uh, all in, for- in favor, please respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. And the motion is back before us again. Matt, is there a particular action you would like to like the EDA to take on this item? Yes, we are looking for approval of the uh, shared corridor vision report. I, I would move that we adopt the plan with the provision that we refer to the mayor's office a request to include um, consideration for funding to implement um, some of the provisions. Uh, and I'm gonna leave funding vague whether it's coming through the 25 million through the city budget process, wherever he finds it, but we need the funding. <laughs> we have a second for that motion. I second that motion. Thank you. Motion by Alder Johnson, seconded by Ms. Yang. Uh, any other questions or comments on th- that item? If not, um, could we please to favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, next item, Matt, since you're you're all warmed up, we're going to turn you back here one more time for the Parklet Grant Program. Sounds great. All right. Okay, so um, we are looking to implement the, the shared vision corridor report, uh, sh- shared corridor vision report rather. Um, and a big key piece of this is um, helping our, our businesses implement parklets. Um, so we are proposing to create a brand new uh, downtown area parklet grant program. Um, this is just the first page of our new policy document that we are proposing. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with parklets, here's an image of one right there. And um, basically it's a deck structure um, installed just off the curb, basically to extend your pedestrian space into a uh, typically a parking stall um, in the street. And of course the purpose of this is to support our downtown business community in the wake of COVID-19. Um, to allow them to expand their business operations outdoors and into the public right away. Um, we also wanna activate our streets beyond COVID um, to, you know, uh, to have some of those great experiences, um, business, those great local business experiences that we were just talking about with the last agenda item um, to make our, our streets more friendly to pedestrians um, and, and cyclists. And this is just a, a something that we're seeing in more and more cities across the country. And we believe that this grant program would help that along here in Green Bay. Um, So what we are proposing is a grant of up to $5,000 to reimburse 80% of eligible expenses for a parklet. Um, Some eligible expenses um, might be the the labor uh, to construct the parklet. If you need to hire a, a contractor, Um, to purchase the materials, um, the lumber, um, any any material needed uh, for construction of the parklet, Um, some of the permitting fees that's required. um, Those are, we've got a whole list of eligible expenses in the document itself, which was included in the packet. Um, And all in all, we've got $20,000 to uh, 
to create this program to get it started at least. Um, $20,000 is coming from um, TID5, and this is a, I'm gonna show a map of this area here in a little while. Um, because this is uh, funded through a, a downtown area TID district, um, we are restricted to using these funds within a half mile of that district. Um, some of the requirements, the projects of course need to meet our city's standards, which were created with our parking parklet ordinance last year. Um, and they need to be eligible to receive that parklet permit. Um, the Department of Public Works is nearing completion of a parklet permit application uh, process. Um, and so uh, once that gets wrapped up, um, our intention is to release this grant program um, and work with businesses um, to make sure that they could um, be eligible for that permit um, in order to be considered for a grant. Um, once the, an, a business uh, submits their application, um, our city staff will for them based on the criteria that's listed in that, that policy but in the package. Um, and then we would take it back to this body um, with a recommendation of approval or denial. Um, and this body would uh, make that final call. Um, as far as who is eligible, um, basically um, anyone, property owners, business owners, um, nonprofit organizations, um, they would be the, the applicant, they would receive the grants and they would own the, the parklet itself. This gets back a little bit to Tara's question earlier. They would be the owner of the parklet. It's a, it's a removable structure. Um, our ordinance currently only allows parklets to be installed on city streets um, during the warmer months of the year. And so they'd be able for relocating the parklet off the city street in those winter months um, and getting it reinstalled um, back when it's parklet season again. Um, and they would also be um, responsible for maintaining the parklet because it's their property. So if it gets damaged, um, they're the ones responsible for, for repairing the, that, that um, infrastructure. This is that TID map I was just um, discussing. So TID 5, uh, Tax Increment District 5, is the area in orange, um, primarily in the downtown area. And uh, we are able to use these funds within a half mile of that orange area. So we've got that um, shown in the, the, um, the red uh, hash marks line right there. So it's pretty much limited to just the downtown area. Um, and as far as our, our timeline goes, um, as I mentioned, Public Works is nearing completion of their parklet permit application process. Once that gets wrapped up, will our department, uh, Community and Economic Development, will release um, the grant announcement um, if this gets approved, as well as a parklet handbook. Um, our team worked with ISG Engineering, a local engineering firm, to create a handbook um, which is basically just public guidance um, as to help them understand what a parklet is, um, what are the local rules on parklets, um, and what are the processes for getting uh, a parklet approved. So we'd uh, release both of those documents out to the public, um, and we'd also have a, a little bit more detail as to the, the formal application deadlines for the first round. Um, once the once DPW releases their, their application process for, for the permit itself. Um, after that initial round, we like I said, we've only got $20,000 currently. Um, if there's additional funds left after the first round, we would have a second round. Um, if it's very popular, we might try to find additional funds um, if, if possible. Um, that's that's my little presentation on this. Um, I'm sure there's some questions, so I wanna make sure we had some time. Um, so at that, I'll open it up for questions. Um, Matt, thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, appreciate it. Yeah. I was wondering um, if you can also um, let us know if there's like a priority region or area in the downtown um, district that you guys are looking to particularly have businesses apply for? And how are you guys um, promoting this um, particular grant? And also, sorry, three questions in one. Um, is this an evergreen um, an evergreen grant? So say they got this grant, this $5,000 um, grant to, to get this parklet up and going. Is this something that they can just continue, continuously put out um, 
every year for the next 10, 15 years? Or how does that work? Okay. Um, make sure I got them all. So the first one, any uh, area of particular focus? Um, as I mentioned, it's really only within the, the area that's eligible for TID $5, so that the mapped area that I, show, I, I showed earlier. Um, there's, I don't believe we have in our criteria anything um, mentioning specific areas of focus. Um, so really, I believe it's just anywhere in that area. Um, second question. I'm sorry, it's, I'm drawing up, what was the second one before? <laughs> uh, the second one was, how are you guys going to promote this grant? Yes, we will have a um, uh, press release um, and get, we're gonna work very closely with the, the two downtown area business districts to get information out to um, the business owners. Um, I think we are also possibly looking at holding um, maybe a public meeting where people can ask questions um, to staff um, and get some more information on what this program is and what are the rules around it. Um, that's not been finalized yet, but it's something that I think we would like to try to do. And Matt, you want to recap the fact that the, the city actually has, we actually have our park, we have a parklet of our own that we're probably going to be putting out as a demonstration at some point so folks can actually come take a look at it. About that. So um, late last year, the city actually um, had some funds secure to create our, a parklet of our own. Um, so we had $5,000 to spend on our own parklet to give the community example of um, what a really good parklet could be. Um, and we had some, in, in previous years, um, those who are familiar, we had these better block projects um, where we had temporary parklets out in, and those were made usually of um, low cost materials like um, uh, uh, plywood and I'm, I'm blanking on the word. Um, pallets. Pallets, thank you. Too many P words today. Um, pallets and, and, and plywood, and uh, they're not really a good example. It's not what we're really looking to fund here. Um, so we wanted to show the community the potential of what a parklet could be. Um, so we have really high quality materials. Um, and we'll here this spring as soon as um, the application process gets approved through DPW. Um, and to answer your third question, um, whether this is an evergreen grant. Um, so currently we only have that $20,000 to spend. It's a finite amount. Um, it would be there to help a business get a parklet launched. Um, and, you know, ideally this is something that they would be able to um, have for many, many years. Our parklet that the city built really high quality, durable materials. It's something that we would be hoping um, businesses that apply for this program would aspire to. Um, so the, the parklet itself should last several years. Um, it would have to get pulled off city streets during those winter months, but it could always get redeployed um, every year um, in that same location as long as DPW's um, approval processes um, are complied with. Um, you shouldn't hopefully need additional funds or at least too much uh, additional funds to maintain that parklet, but it would be your property, the business owner's property to maintain that over, over time. Hey, thank you so much, Matt. And then, um, sorry, I know there's probably many more questions, but just a real last quick question. Um, so with the parklet that the city is putting out, are you guys doing it within the $5,000 minimum or uh, maximum, or are you guys um, using additional funds to that? That was separate funding. That's yeah, okay. that was already expended through different a different source. Okay, sorry. And then, sorry to clarify that. Is the total of the, the funds that you guys are using to build this parklet, is it $5,000 or is, does it exceed that? I could exceed that. Um, the grant dollars, we, we're generally going to allow for $5,000 grants, I believe. Um, this is a new program, so I think we're open to adjusting should we need to. Um, but ideally, we've got $20,000 so we could fund possibly up to four parklets, mm -hmm. um, it reimburse 80% of the cost of a parklet. So the business would have to have some skin in the game um, to, um, to go above and beyond that 5,000. I think that would roughly shake out to about $1,200 of their own to invest in the parklet to meet that minimum match requirement. Thank you. Sure. 
Just a couple of questions for you, Matt. Could, could you explain the $20,000 pull from the TID? And in particular, is that kind of like a ceiling for us? Is that what the TID has available? Is there additional capacity? Does that require approval by city council and the joint review board? Uh, could you just kind of walk us through that a little bit? We do have a ceiling. It's just a little bit north of $25,000. Neil might be able to help with that, answer a little bit more, provide more detail. Um, Part of the reason why we we started out with twenty thousand dollars is we're not entirely sure how um, how many applicants we're going to have with this first round, so it's just kind of a starting point, I think. Um, and it, it is it just worked to be a good round number with hopefully spending as many as four um, four parklets. Did you have more to add to that, Neil, or a better way to answer that? As far as where Alder Johnson, there that is that is what's available, at least from a budget standpoint. But it, it this is I think we evaluate this was an eligible expenditure that was defined in the project plan already. So in terms of having to go back for additional approvals, there won't be any requirements of doing that. Um, but I think if this you know certainly if I think this body came, we came back and decided that the program was successful, uh, you know we would probably be coming back and, and making a request for for additional funds to put towards this program if it really looked like it was working. But we would have to make sure that obviously that there's cash in the there's there's cash in the account to basically to do that for the for the future years and coming forward so it would be a budget exercise just making sure that there's funds there right now my understanding is based on what was budgeted there is only twenty five thousand uh, you know up to twenty five thousand left right now so a twenty thousand dollar program just to be on be a little bit more conservative at this point so uh, there may be a little bit of additional funds available but i'm not i'm not i do not believe that there's a, a wide open we could we could double or triple the program if we had to i think it is pretty much what was budgeted that, that's helpful to know and i'm just wondering wondering if, if in fact it is a $25,000 limit, you know, rather than coming back to this body and asking for another 5,000, if we could just authorize that, that 25 right now, is there any opposition from staff to do that? I think it would just maybe request that it would be up to, up to 25, Alder Johnson, just to make sure that we have, again, the, the, the funds in there to make sure that they are actually available. Up yeah, and I'm not, that. and I'm certainly not asking you guys to spend it if there's not a quality proposal. And, and, you know, Matt, much like the facade improvement grant, I mean, we've turned, we've turned proposals away because they, they didn't meet, you know, the right, the right check boxes. So I, I, but I'd rather, you know, this is one of those things where I can certainly see the cost of a parklet easily, you know, doing that 5,000. And now we have, you know, funding for four throughout that whole downtown area. And it'd be nice, like if we can get a fifth, I'd, I'd rather just do it now. So, um, okay. So the, um, you know, just for what it's worth, Matt, and I know we've talked about this, but one of the, the bits of feedback that I've received from a few business owners that I've spoken with uh, is just the challenges with storage. So, so they make the investment, but then they have no place to go with the parklet. So if there's anything that the city can do to continue to uh, think about solutions on that front, uh, it would be very much appreciated. Um, the, the Davis-Bacon rules, is that going to apply here, Matt? No, these are not federal dollars, so those don't apply. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then I wanted to ask about um, the requirement to use beyond, like within the year, you have up to a year to do this. And to me, it seems that we're, um, our objective ought to be to get these things out as quickly as possible if we're going to be investors in this program. Um, does a year seem appropriate? Because my fear is, you know, you, you grant someone up to a year, now they're not going in until 2022, when the idea is to be a response to COVID. Sure. Your thoughts on that? I think I, yeah, of course, ideally, I'd love to get these out sooner rather than later. Um, it's still a little bit of a foreign concept for Green Bay. I'm not sure how many um, contractors are, are available for this kind of work. And schedules are tight. So I think we were just, our thoughts were to give a little bit of flexibility um, to allow for, for more time should it be needed. Um, but I think if there's a strong opinion from, from this body is to, to shorten that up or to um, change some language a bit, I think we'd be open. Well, I think at least giving preference maybe uh, to those who are ready to install this year would, would be appropriate. Because again, and we're looking for immediate impact on a program. If, if, if we want folks to install in 2022 or, or potentially beyond, I think there, 
there are other ways that we can, uh, you know, find funding solutions for that. But I think to me, this should be about immediacy. So I would certainly give your, your scoring process uh, preferential treatment on that front. That was going to be my recommendation, Alder Johnson, is that we, we, I think in terms of, again, without knowing what the demand is going to be, let's assume we get a, a dozen applications. Yeah, I certainly think that ones that are ready to, that meet all the, the other design criteria and ones that are ready to go and want to get it deployed faster are definitely going to score more higher, more a higher priority, I think, in the system. I think staff would be in full agreement with that. Okay. Uh, and then the issue of permit timing. Um, is, is your office having conversations with the Department of Public Works? Because in particular, the ordinance is written to give, you know, special treatment to those who apply by February 1st. Uh, and then it goes on to say anybody who applies, I think by May 1st, uh, you know, will kind of be addressed uh, on an as submitted basis. So, I mean, we're reviewing a parklet. This isn't rocket science. So are, are we having proactive conversations with Public Works about the expediency of review? They, were, they had a lot of involvement in, in all of this. Um, so we, we do coordinate very closely with them. Um, it's why we're not launching this program until they're ready um, with their application process for the permit itself. Um, so to, yes, to answer your question, we are. Okay. Yeah, I just we, hope there's we, a way that we can really, again, get that decision quickly and it doesn't just get set on the back burner. No, absolutely, Alder Johnson. I think the 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 you know, certainly impetus behind this is was I think the message was very clear that yeah, I agree with your your comments uh, exactly that this is a response to COVID. This is an extra tool to deal with recovery on that. Waiting until July or August to get this implemented is not really helping anybody out, <laughs> uh, and at least not to the extent that we can be. So yeah, I think it's going to be a message from staff or to staff has been pretty clear that we want to get these things out and deployed as quickly as possible. Okay. And then, you know, one of the things looking at some of the photos, and I know they're just, you know, stock photos sometimes that are put out there to generate ideas. Uh, but in the scoring concept, I would prefer to see preferential treatment given to those that are going to help businesses. And so what I mean by that is, you know, patio spaces, things that allow businesses to expand their, their service areas. I mean, like things like a mini golf course are, are cute. Um, but I don't think they necessarily, you know, I, I don't think most businesses would support, you know, giving up parking stalls for mini golf courses uh, that don't necessarily help drive additional foot traffic or expansion of, of spaces. So, so that would just be one recommendation to give on that front. And then one last question. Um, in, the, in the document, Matt, that you had provided, we were looking at um, a, a grant deadline application of April 21st with a second round um, in May. That seems very, 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 very fast since design is probably the most important element of this process. Can we push yeah, that out? Right. To my, uh, one of the comments I made earlier, we're, we're waiting on uh, Public Works to really fine tune their permit application process. And we can't really roll this out until that's final. Um, we anticipate that I'll be um, coming forward very soon, but the whole timeline is going to depend on when that part permit application process is complete. So um, that, that date's gonna have to change. Um, okay, and, and I'm okay with, you know, it, even though we meet the first, what, the first Monday of the month, I personally mm -hmm. would be okay calling a special meeting of the EDA uh, it, it, to review applications, depending on how this cycle flows out, if it means expediting this process and getting these things on the street. So again, thanks for all your hard work on this, Matt. Looks great. Great, thank you. Great idea. Matt, I wanted to um, also touch a little bit about um, what Alderman um, Brian also said about um, the using the funds within a year. I also want to, you know, make sure that we are also sensitive to um, some of the small businesses. I, I want this project to, obviously, you know, we are, this is for the pandemic, but also we have a lot of small businesses who don't have a lot of employees or who don't have the capacity to always um you know, be at the table to be, you know, like looking at designs and doing things as, as such. So, you know, I, you know, for this, I hope that we do look through an equity lens as well, um, focusing not just on businesses who are ready and up and going and ready to get going because Carvana on Broadway, who has eight to 10 employees working at any hour versus um, my agro deli who has like three people working so like you know I, I want to be also respectful to those type of businesses out there too that's a great point tara thank you 
Um, if you have specific recommendations and as to language we might include, I think we'd absolutely be open to that. But I think just based on how our staff feels, I, I think we would do that anyway. Um, but we're open to any language changes if you got if you have some suggestions. Um, and I'm just I'm happy to hear that you guys um, already have that lens that focus. So thank you. It, it wouldn't hurt to form formalize something though, Tara, we can, we, we can have the best of intentions, but if there's some, you still, if you have some ideas or recommendations on language, we'd, we'd be more than happy to take a look at that. So please let, let Matt or I know, that'd be great. We'd appreciate it. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Any other questions for Matt on the Parklift grant program? Matt, do you have a specific action you would like from the from the EDA tonight? I uh, would be requesting approval of the Park Lake Grant Program, um, and um, yeah, I think that'd be sufficient. Move so approved. Presented. I'll Amazing. second. All right. Uh, motion by Alder Johnson, seconded oh. by Whoop. Sorry, Neil. I move that we approve uh, with one modification. Changing twenty thousand to twenty five thousand. Oh, that's correct. Sorry, we made that that note earlier. Does the second agree with that uh, that clarification, Michael? Oh yes, it, yes, yes. Hey. I second with that. With that. All change. right. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other discussion on this item? What's that? We have a motion to approve the program uh, as presented, with the addition of to up to twenty five thousand dollars to be invested in this program. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Matt. All right, uh, last sections here, just informational uh, director's report. Just I'll be very brief. Um, just folks, if we are we're ending up doing several amendments to several TIF districts here in the city. Uh, city Council approved uh, allocation amendments, housing extensions, and closures of several districts. I believe it was seven, eight, nine, and 23 were the districts that were all the ones that we have been taking action on. Those are being presented to the Joint Review Board this Thursday afternoon. Uh, we are anticipating really being um, not really any issues on this one. These are all pretty advantageous. So we'll be happy to get those taken care of. However, we're all going to certainly for in the interest of this body, uh, we will also be looking at uh, the likelihood of, of the creation of a couple of new districts related to industrial development, uh, probably later on here this year. So please anticipate, would expect us bring, bringing some information back to this body uh, in terms of a potential new district or two related to industrial development, certainly within the next month or two. I think we've got some concepts we would like to bring to the EDA for discussion regard, related to, to that. Um, we are seeing some industrial activity is the main reason we're kind of getting firing these up. I think that we were, we were thinking about staff was already thinking about doing some new districts anyways, particularly the I-43 corridor, uh, the business park, the area we were really certainly looking at already. We are seeing some interest uh, in so much to so what Manny's comments were earlier. Uh, we do do believe that the the market is kind of uh, certainly increasing and intensifying right now. So it's a good time for us to kind of get that in place and figure out what the next round of expansion might be related to industrial development. Um, we are still work, staff is still working uh, on kind of breathing some life back into several um, multifamily residential projects that have been dealing with delays and so forth related to COVID and financing shifts and other things that have happened. We are working on bringing several of those back to the RDA for approval. Um, hopefully we'll have some information uh, at the next couple of meetings. The next meeting we have with RDA is actually next Tuesday, I believe, week from tomorrow. Um, but we're also going to be looking at some, some probably a fairly active uh, meeting in May. So watch for some additional residential projects there. Um, and then just a note, and then, no, I don't think anyone on this, this, uh, this call will be surprised. Uh, we continue to see uh, some distress from our hospitality businesses, uh, several of the hotels dealing with, with a variety of issues, certainly related to low occupancy and low rates. Uh, a couple of those projects that we have, you know, have some financing or some assistance requirements in place are the city is working with them, staff's working with them to try to provide some relief in terms of ensuring that they uh, have some opportunity to kind of get back on their feet and get their occupancy rates back up before we require some of the 
some of the financing and other things to be paid back on that. So working with them to provide a little bit of flexibility on that. Um, and with that, certainly available for any and staff is available for any other questions anyone may have on that. Does anyone have any questions or updates they would like us to have at this time? A full meeting. It was a good one. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we yeah, like yeah. these. We, we like these when they're full. This is it's nice to have. It's worth everybody's time then. So <laughs> that's right. That's great. Great. Well, I think the only other item I think we have, Chair, is uh, I don't know, Matt, do we have a Brownfields program update at all tonight? Not a very robust one. I know we had a full meeting tonight. Um, okay. We'll have more at the next meeting. I think okay. I said that last time, but we'll definitely have more at the next meeting. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, last item then, Chair, is date of next meeting. We're looking at May 3rd, 2021 is our, our next date on that. Uh, so we'll be sending out confirmation for attendance for everyone at that meeting. And uh, with that, uh, we are at adjournment, so we could have a motion. So move. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor to adjourn. All in favor, please respond by saying aye. Aye. Aye, aye. and uh, all, any opposed? All right. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.